Do you believe in a way? Has anyone been there? Do I need a visa to go there, even if I'm in Arizona? Where's a way? On a finite planet, especially water, there's no way. Tell me about the size of the trash patch out in the North Pacific Gyre right now. There's no way. They're not going away. So the way is, oh, you want to make it go away? Well, you'll flood your neighbors out downstream. This is our, uh, in the watershed that Anna and I met each other in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. This is the, the treatment plant for a bunch of cities. And that was a very, that was a 10 year event, but they hadn't planned in their thing all of the imperviousness over the 20 years preceding <coughs> to the discharge and the increase in the runoff coefficient. And, and increasingly, in many, many parts of the planet, this is what people are witnessing, just declining groundwater tables. As There's no innocent straw out there, as far as I can tell. And if you're gonna put a straw in the ground, and I was a little bit concerned that to learn that, like in California, the last state in the US, you all as well don't regulate groundwater. That's what I'm told. So the, the groundwater being probably the oldest water, depending on how deep it is, the least recharge, the least connected to the annual income allowance from your hydrologic cycle that year is the most unregulated. It don't make any sense in California, and I think that's a trans-border uh, uh, circular logic thing that it don't make sense up here either. You got groundwater becomes a really critical, both shallow groundwater that connects to creeks through base flow and deeper groundwater. So I guess, do you believe in the drainage? The age of draining everything, where you create a dehydrated, desiccated, drainage-based design, or do you believe in a retain age, where you're going to slow it, spread it, sink it, and figure out how to see your roof as an above-ground well and put it into a tank and see that street as an opportunity and see that area as, a, as, a, as an opportunity to harvest. And we begin to move into concave-based landscape systems versus convex. And, and certainly, and I really honor the different discussions today about freezing and, and, and slopes and slope stability and recharge and soils. And, and so all of this is to be taken with a, a grain of sand or clay, depending on which porosity issue you've got, and design accordingly. I'm not, but conceptually, how do you perceive it? This is the woman I went to China with, and this idea that if water is the foundation of life, it must also be the foundation uh, in the built environment. I think if I asked the question as a designer, what would water want? If I, if I design a system to take care of the quantity and quality of water through my built environment, whatever that's going to be, rural residential, vineyard, grazing, forestry, intensive ag, urbanization, what would water want? If I design to take care of water, what I'll build that does carbon, that does pollution, that does transportation, that does those other functions, I think will be really good. It will be darn well better than what we got now. Um, and we got to just stop using water. And conservation is the best thing we can do to stop using it. And if you're going to use it, use it efficiently, indoor and outdoor. Do you all talk much? I haven't heard anybody talk about this thing up here, the water energy nexus. And I was asking Anna a little bit. It sounds like you've got such a big portfolio of hydro that maybe your sense is, is that your electricity grid is, has a fairly low water footprint per se. I don't know. But for those of us who are further south and have nuclear in there, coal and oil and these other kinds of systems. Um, the connectivity between how much water electricity requires, the footprint of water, is a pretty impressive deal. And again, it depends on where you're at. This, this study comes from the National Renewable Energy Lab down in the states there. And so if, on average in America, we're using 100 gallons a day per person for consumptive use, bathing, showering, washing the dog, laundry, that kind of stuff. And folks really want to cut into that number, low flow everything, which is great. But on average, with uh, food miles in our neck of the woods of 1,500 miles from food to plate, you got to load in another 510 gallons of water just for your food budget. We call it virtual water in your agricultural production. And then depending on your energy matrix, again, it sounds like maybe yours is, is maybe on the lower end here, I don't know, but there could be somewhere up in this range. So just to live your life to have electricity and food and consumptive water, you could be using a thousand gallons a day ahead where I come from. And that's bringing that piece of the puzzle in because each one of these, what's the carbon footprint, CO2, greenhouse gas emissions footprint here? What's the greenhouse gas emissions footprint here? And if you would like to get out reducing your, your CO2 emissions to be in compliance with your, your carbon issues that you have, and my understanding is you guys have got some regs on that, then if you don't look at energy, if you don't look at food, if you don't look at transportation, 
then you're not going to get there, you get, right? And certainly the low impact development world has, is what we've been talking about a lot. And so I'm not going to elaborate on that because you guys are all professionals in that. We do have a group down in San Francisco Bay that's called the Bay Friendly Landscaping folks. And I just like their little diagram here. They really talk about that you're land landscaping locally. You got to nurture the soil, right? We're conserving the water, the quantity and taking care of the quality of both air and water to get better wildlife habitat and have less go into the landfill while we're also conserving energy. And this is what professional landscapers, just doing outside landscaping, they buy into these principles and they're building that into their landscape designs as an integrated whole. And, and it's the multiple benefit piece. Some of us last night were talking about gray water. In California, we just rewrote our, it's called Chapter 16A of the Uniform Plumbing Code. So now in California, anywhere in the state, if you want to take your laundry, put a three-way brass valve on it and have one side go to the municipal system and one side go out to the landscape into an excavated basin filled with wood chips and an opportunity for subsurface disposal. No permit needed anywhere in the state right now in California as of about six months ago for gray water. So now we're purple pipe is great, but if I can use it on my property, reuse it, take the gallon I showered with or the gallon I did laundry with, and then get that's another gallon of irrigation out of that. So I got two gallons of use and only one electricity push through versus pumping it back to you so you can treat it to pump it back to me in a purple pipe. Any way you can get rid of that Rube Goldberg machine at any point in time would be helpful, I think. And then there's a lot of push around that in, in many places, and, and this is in Portland for looking at your roof to store water as above ground wells. Um, I didn't, I realized I didn't convert these over metrically. So you guys probably are better at that. I am going either way, but an inch of rain on a thousand square feet is a 600 gallons. So I don't know who does those numbers for me out of your head, the square feet, but it's, it's generally for people they, it's, it's a larger amount of water than the average person thinks is coming off their roof is the take home message on this deal. And like you all, where I live in a Mediterranean climate with a, generally a four month wet season, I don't know what's happening on the shoulders now, um, and a long dry season, that we need just bigger storage tanks. This is a 27,000 gallon ferro cement tank that gets its water off that roof of that building. That building has five kilowatts of photovoltaics and solar hot water. So the roof keeps the water out, makes all its electricity, makes all its hot water, and catches all the drinking water for the entire operation for the family of three in their home. And they did that to get out of the creek for in-stream flows for fisheries because they had a shallow gallery well. So the mantra where I live, and I kind of think it applies to you all to some degree, is that we don't live in a water scarce area down where I'm at. We live in a storage scarce area. Storage becomes the, the hard piece to sort out. In-ground storage or liquid assets in a tank storage, lots of forms of storage, but dispersed decentralized storage. Here's a really simple system that some folks say, well, it's really expensive to do this, and I need a roof, and I need a special gutter, and I need a special fascia board, and all this. And this system is my goat feeding shed for our milking dairy goats. And it's got a single pitch, and here's the nod to the, the folks with the ADS uh, booth out there, the advanced range system, plastic pipe folks. I, I just take their little flexible drain pipe, solid pipe, slice it, slide it, and store it. And it basically is a really effective gutter. On any corrugated roof, you can just slice it, slide it, store it. Super cheap, really, really effective for the agricultural operations. In our case, I then gravity feed that out of this tank here down to my chicken yard and the goats. But there's no pumps associated with it. There's no nothing. It's all on a passive gravity-fed float switch. I haven't fussed with the water for three years at this point. The flexible drain pipe, we haven't had laying around. So in those rural residential areas, it's pretty effective. The state of California is on board with us here. This is a project we did at a school, and, and this is a campus. They catch the water off the roof, put it in a tank, and they have 30,000 gallons for their organic vegetable garden there, and the state paid for that system. Our federal government, our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the parent of the National Marine Fishery Service, who regulates our endangered species, our salmonids, they're now looking at, this was a poster from a recent conference, so I get application of roof water harvesting techniques for the conservation of endangered salmonids. So we just got a million and a half bucks out of the Obama stimulus package, and we're taking an entire community and getting every house 
out of the creek for five to six months out of the year by storing water off their roof. We've got the fire hall with 40,000 gallons off its roof. We got one dairy with 70,000. And then this is a dairy off that roof. We have 240,000 gallons underground storage filled off the roof and he will be 100% out of the creek with no in-stream withdrawals from the creek during the entire dry season. All of this is on behalf of maintaining base flow water quality quantity for fisheries with federal funding. Because where I live, coho salmon is the, is the critter we're most concerned about. And sediment is, is the big deal for us as well. Besides water quantity, we got quality and dirt in the creek and how to keep that out of there. If you would like, these are the best books that I know of, this friend of mine, Brad Lancaster, volume one and two, Rainwater Harvesting for Dry Lands and Beyond. I think this deeply applies for you all. That second book is 400 pages of examples of different ways that indigenous people and folks all over the world have managed their watersheds in ways to slow spread and sink. You can find them on the web easy enough. And I'm off to give a talk next week in Albuquerque, New Mexico to the Kivira Coalition and they've just got these basic watershed principles. So these folks are in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Pretty dry, right? That they're protecting and expanding the moisture storing areas of the landscape, stabilizing the active erosion, preventing further degradation, restoring the dispersed flow and increasing infiltration at every opportunity. That cultivation of restorative plant communities to build the soil and then the site-specific solutions using natural forms and processes. Great little basic set of guidelines. What they look like is up to you all to figure out. They've got a whole vision for carbon ranches, looking at the entire ranch, and the, the title of the conference will be the Carbon Ranch Using Food and Stewardship to Build Soil and Fight Climate Change. And this is what enviros and ranchers have gotten together to talk about down in Albuquerque in New Mexico and Arizona. And I know you all have a big ranching community around here. The talk I'm going to give is basically this. It's grain fed, not grain fed. How do we get the animals back on the land and out of the feedlots and stop feeding them corn so that they belch all that methane out of there, right, and get them back on grass? It's better for climate to have cows not burping methane, right? So I'm really looking for a catalytic converter here. <laughs> and ultimately in Watershed, you all know that it's a multi-stakeholder process. And as an, as an omnivore here, I'm interested in people holding lots of stakes up and, and barbecuing those. One of the things we've worked a lot with is several counties, Santa Cruz County now and Sonoma County. We have a, these new documents, Slow It, Spread It, Sink It, this homeowner and landowner's guide to beneficial stormwater management. Pretty simple guide, beautiful color pictures, lots of case studies. As far as I can tell, this would be a great project for the Okanagan Water Board and others that partner with them. They'll probably give you the whole document for free, the computer thing. You guys can customize it, add your own photos. And, and print it out. It's a great public outreach education uh, document for getting homeowners on board, which I think you really need. Assuming you've got, you've got the technical prowess and appears the policy prowess. Um, this is out of that Sonoma Valley, folks. They've just finished this brand new slide, mapping the entire watershed based on veg and soil slopes and geology for its recharge potential. Where it's green, best recharge, yellow, a little bit worse. And they're basically, and then, is it public land? Is it private land? Who owns it? What's the land use? And beginning to set up a long-term plan to retrofit that lifeboat there to be as infiltrative as possible. You guys know a lot about these green streets and narrowing and curb cutouts and bioswales, and I'm not going to go there much. China's pretty much into green streets, as far as I can tell there. <laughs> um, the rain garden thing, I was talking to Anna, we were out at the little ecological center here, and found a spot that looks like a perfect rain garden location. And one of the things I think the rain garden movement needs to do is develop regional plant pallets of your natives that can have their feet wet for three months and then can dry out and can be frozen. And because there's the xeriscape, the upland drought tolerant type landscape, that's pretty well articulated if you go to nurseries. But the nurseries, I don't, at least not where I'm at, have a special rain garden, stormwater garden plant palette, and that would be a really good thing for the, the plant geeks, the botany geeks to bring forward. But what's the Okanagan plant palette for stormwater gardens? 